So, Dave had asked me to talk about ultra, neon, and LDR, and potential linkages between these networks and efforts that are growing. Um, so, what I'll present today is a little bit of, about these various efforts that are underway, and I'll focus most on ultra, which is the part that I've been contributing to most directly. <coughs> So ULTRA stands for Urban Long-Term Research Area. This is a relatively new initiative by NSF. In 2009, there was an RFP, and the goal of the ULTRA X program, it's an exploratory award, which is still in the exploratory phase, uh, was to provide support to enable teams of scientists and practitioners to conduct interdisciplinary research on the dynamic interaction between people and nature and natural ecosystems in urban settings in ways that will advance fundamental and applied knowledge. The program is supported uh, by the Division of Environmental Biology and by uh, Behavioral and Cognitive Sciences. So this was in 2009. Today, there's an RFP pending soon. Um, and the goal is that there will be one or two, and I'm optimistically hoping it's at least two, full ultras that are funded. So the ultras uh, in this initial competition, and they're expecting that there will be additional Ultra X awards. So these ultras, in many respects, are expected to function like LTERs, except the focus is much more on urban areas and urban ecology and coupled human natural systems. Uh, in addition to NSF, the EPA has also become engaged in ultra efforts. So the support is still there. Um, funding is pending. Uh, there are 21 ultra X sites around the country. This is a map that I recently found where you can actually see where they're all located. Um, there's a cluster of them in New England. There's two in Boston, uh, two in New York City, uh, as well as uh, the DC area. And so exactly what the future holds for this program is unknown. Nonetheless, I can say that uh, our ultra-related efforts have um, mushroomed out of control in some respects. <laughs> and I'll just be able to show you a little bit of what we've been doing in that regard. So to set the stage, um, ultra overlaps with LTER. LTER has two urban sites in Baltimore and Phoenix. And the goals of ULTRA are not that different from LTER. Um, there's, there's a, this is from the LTER mission, from the LTER homepage, which is to provide the scientific community, policymakers, and society with knowledge and predictive understanding necessary to conserve, protect, and manage our nation's ecosystems, biodiversity, and the services they provide. And those ecosystems already include urban and human influenced and human dominated systems. Ultra is just adding additional um, resources along those lines. There's also the CTFS network, which Stuart Davies is here. Um, the CTFS network is run out of the Smithsonian. And they also have an overlapping mission, uh, which is to promote and coordinate long-term biological and socioeconomic research within the tropic, within tropical forests and forest dependent communities, and then reach out to management, conservation, and natural resource policies. CTFS uh, grew out of the tropics, but has extended. Um, this map shows where the current CTFS sites are, and as you can see, there's eight in temperate North America. So CTFS is also um, become a significant player, becoming a significant player in uh, this national effort uh, to coordinate ecological research. And then, of course, there's uh, NEON, uh, which has been coming for a long time and is about to literally be here, I understand. Um, and NEON uh, appropriations have moved forward. And NEON is a continental scale effort to design, implement, and operate the first and foremost continental scale scientific infrastructure to enable research, discovery, and education about ecological change. NEON uh, is located, they've uh, 
sliced the country into a, a series of domains. And in the northeastern domain, you can see that um, this shows where LTER sites are, as well as core neon sites. Harvard Forest is a core neon site. And there will be a relocatable neon site located in Burlington, Massachusetts. Um, and I don't know the exact timeline for when that's going to come online. But these four networks, which are um, each doing incredible work in this direct in, in this area, they all include Harvard Forest. Harvard Forest is the rural end member of our Ultra X gradient. It's an LTER site. It's a CTFS site, and it's the the first, I believe, uh, neon site that's being built up. So this this really represents a tremendous opportunity for the LTER to take the research and outreach in new directions that wouldn't have been possible with LTER funding alone and LTER support alone. And I uh, titled my talk something along the lines of Ultra Opportunities to Bridge Ecosystems, People, and Land Management. And that's what I really see this as with, with all of this support and the core competencies that we have on the biophysical sciences. It's an opportunity for us to take this and uh, reach out to land managers and people and reach some of those novel ecosystems. So let me go into more detail about what we're doing on our Ultra X. <coughs> so our Ultra X is titled The Metabolism of Boston. It takes a, um, but an analogy to uh, biological metabolism, except we're looking at the metabolism of a city where that's encapsulating both the biogenic and the anthropogenic uh, contributions and transformations. So our overarching research question is how do humans and their built and natural environments inter interact to produce geospatially and temporally varied carbon dioxide exchange in a metropolitan region? So this was the question that we had driving the exploratory phase of our, our, our project. And that's where we still are. As we grow from an ultra X, hopefully into a full-fledged ultra, um, this, pro this overarching research question will also grow. Um, the metabolism framework is likely to be maintained, but will move beyond CO2. Under this question, what we've been pursuing is, um, is very interdisciplinary. And we've been working on um, the policy and economic side and the behavioral levers that are driving much of the metabolism that we're observing. So we're not just trying to characterize the net exchange of CO2, but understand from a socio-ecological perspective why and where it's coming from. Um, we've been also looking at distributed networks, including roads, uh, energy, social governance, and looking at how those operate as we go across an urban to rural gradient, and how those are influencing our net um, estimates of urban carbon metabolism. And finally, I won't actually show any results on this one. Uh, we've been looking at lags, legacies, and feedbacks of past land use. Um, my colleague at Boston University, uh, Curtis Woodcock, has been doing some really exciting work in this arena where the entire Landsat archive has now been classified for Massachusetts. And we can see the space-time evolution of the land change, which adds an incredible dimension to what we're doing. So um, this is a very interdisciplinary effort. And uh, we have already implemented a suite of uh, biophysical measurements. And we're coupling this to data and uh, social surveys on the human and built environments to try to exchange to try to estimate the carbon exchange. We're using the atmosphere as something of an integrator, especially in this exploratory phase, because the, the atmosphere is where this carbon ends up. It may not stay there, but at some point it's moving through the atmosphere. So um, the atmosphere is capturing the net effects of these uh, economic um, drivers, human preferences, and then the policy that's driving them. So this is a, an animation that I've shown a few times, but now I actually have results to go with it, which is kind of exciting. 
Um, what we've been uh, doing at the core of this is we've been making CO2, uh, atmospheric CO2 mixing ratio measurements. And we've been assimilating this data into a model data fusion framework where we can infer sources and sinks and the exchange of CO2 across this full gradient from a time series of concentration measurements. And the concentration measurements are on, have been going on since 2000 and, well, 2009 with the particular instrument we're using now at Boston University. Um, we're collaborating with uh, Bill Munger and Steve Wofsey using the EMS tower data. And then uh, last year we set up another tower in Worcester and we just got permission to set up the sensor on the roof of the Prudential Building in downtown Boston. That was an exciting site visit, I can tell you. Um, and, uh, and we are also going to set one up in Nahant. The Nahant site is uh, particularly exciting because it's underneath the uh, track of the Orbital Carbon Observatory. We're also going to set up uh, an upward looking spectrometer there to measure total CO2. This is a little bit of data from these three sites um, showing how the midday CO2 mixing ratios change. And uh, you can see that in all three sites, you have a clear seasonal signal. Uh, at Harvard Forest, the summertime concentrations are lowest, which is not surprising. Um, but you see that same summertime drawdown occur at all of the sites. And, um, and it, at the Boston site, uh, you can see weekday weekend effects very clearly um, and those effects are strongest during the summer because during the winter you have contributions uh, from heating that are happening all the time. During the summer you don't have those same contributions but the top of the pattern significantly change. So um, we're using this type of CO2 data in a, in a Lagrangian particle, transport, particle dispersion model Still, this is um, being coordinated with Steve Wofsey's lab. And this is the model domain that we're operating this under. So it starts at a continental scale, and the air parcels are moved um, across the continent. As we get closer to our focal area, um, the resolution of the model increases. So we're coupling this transport model with a micrometeorological model, the weather research forecasting model. And then um, within this innermost domain, which you can see here, and those dots on the map are where we have or are about to have uh, CO2 observations. And we're coupling that with high resolution, spatially and temporally resolved estimates of CO2 emissions from different sectors, as well as biogenic exchange. And uh, so I will show you some of the first results from this modeling that has brought all of this together at the end of my talk. But before then, uh, I want to go under the hood on some of these um, estimates that we have within Massachusetts. And because still is time inverted, we're able to use uh, surface concentration measurements to get fluxes across the whole domain. So emissions. Hmm. Um, this is one map and one estimate that we have of national emissions. This is arguably one of the best estimates that we have. It's, uh, it's from the Vulcan Project from Kevin Gurney's group. It is um, very, high, very uh, temporally and spatially resolved for one year, 2002, that's a decade ago. Um, and it estimates all fossil fuel emissions uh, across the United States. You can see Massachusetts all of it goes <laughs> red in this map. And um, if we put the numbers on a per area basis for the emissions coming from Massachusetts versus the sort of sink measurements, and maybe Bill, this number is a little bit low based on the work I lost Bill, but maybe it's a, my Harvard course sink number is a little low there. Um, but that's, that's maybe three. Okay. <laughs> Um, three tons of carbon per hectare per year. Um, and in relation to emissions, it's small. Um, 
And the biological processes, the biological contributions to the terrestrial carbon cycle, I don't need to convince anybody about, but the anthropogenic contribution is really large, and it's what we as a community haven't necessarily been focusing as intensively on. Um, so this is, on average, for the year 2002, a decade ago in Massachusetts. It's not really good enough um, for what we're trying to do in this project. Um, we've been working very hard in acquiring additional higher resolution data. Um, so you can see there on the right, um, the same Vulcan data, we've just zoomed in on a piece of the Boston Metropolitan Statistical Area. And uh, another source of data that we've acquired in collaboration with is the Boston Metropolitan Planning Organization, which is estimates of on-road CO2 emissions um, for the year 2010. And these are both particular year slices with particular features, um, the features I'm using loosely, to them. Um, and this is only the on-road sector contribution to CO2 emissions, which is something like 30% of our total emissions. It depends from region to region exactly what that number is. But these show a completely different pattern. Um, they're at a different spatial resolution, and the pattern that they uh, that you can see here looks very different. You can see the role of the suburbs and the exurbs mm -hmm. in the higher resolution map that you can't see in the same way in the Vulcan data. Um, and one of the things that I'll show you shortly is um, the impact that using these two different emission sources has on our, net, on our estimate of net regional exchange. Um, the Boston Planning Organization produces these sorts of maps decadally. Vulcan is a one-shot estimate. Um, one of the students in, um, in my group is working on doing an annual analysis. So this is for the year 2008. This is at a one kilometer spatial resolution for all of the state of Massachusetts. This data comes from the National Highway Performance um, Connor. Monitoring system. Thank you. Uh, Connor Gaines is in the audience. This is his work. Um, and this is a time series that extends for over 20 years. And as part of this effort, we're looking at how the emissions have changed in space and time and how that's really been driven by the urban infrastructure. So this is, this is still in progress, but we've been devoting a lot of energy to getting the emissions side of the story as, uh, as well as we can. In addition, Robert Kaufman and others have been working on the residential side, looking at um, heating and residential emissions. So jumping to the biogenic, um, Steve Rossini and members of my group have, uh, we've been doing a lot of work looking at how ecosystem structure and soon function, not yet, um, changes as we go across the urban to rural gradients. Um, this is the, these are the same transects that David showed earlier, and the crosses that you can see along those transects are where in 2010 we established field sites. Um, this was stratified by land cover and urban intensity, and one of the things that we tackled in this work was to think about how our definition of urban um, influences <laughs> our estimates of how ecosystems change. Uh, we measured above ground biomass, coarse woody debris biomass, soil chemistry, foliar chemistry, foliar spectra. Um, in 2010, we're also measuring nitrogen deposition variations along this gradient, and um, we just got funding to uh, take this from a stock estimate to estimate MPP through repeated measurements. So I am going to, I showed some of these results last year and the differences that we observed as a function of land cover uh, in above ground biomass. These results are coming out next month in ecological applications, so I'm going to skip this part. Um, and soil carbon. And if we put these together and we look at how much the biosphere is contributing within urban areas to our overall carbon budget, and we use three, four different definitions of urban, um, 
you can see that the biosphere, um, even under the most optimistic <coughs> scenarios, of uh, photosynthetic efficiency is not contributing that much to our, um, our exchange compared to what emissions are um, within these urban areas. On the other hand, if something were to happen, like land use, land cover change, uh, the contribution from these areas of losing the forest that we have left, of losing the vegetation that we have left, could be very significant on the carbon budget. Um, and anything that changes uh, the frequency of disturbance in these areas also has the potential to be very large. So um, these are some of the model results. So this uh, I got just two days ago from Steve Wassey's group. Um, so questions hopefully won't be too hard on this because I just got this data and it's still in progress. Um, but this shows what, if we put the CO2 observations that we're making across this gradient, our emissions estimates together, and try to look at, at how, um, how well we can predict the observations, how well we can integrate all of this to be able to actually close the carbon budget. So this is uh, from, um, we ran this for a month in 2010, this is from August, and what you can see in the red line here is the boundary condition, which is in this case Harvard Forest. So this is data that came from Bill Munger, um, and the blue are our um, on-road emissions. The green here is the contribution of the local biosphere. And then the black um, is the observations. And what you can see is that the model and observations don't agree very well, um, which suggests that we don't yet have this problem solved. Um, and part of the reason that they don't agree, it has to do with these emissions. And if we look in more detail at if we use two different sources for the on-road emissions, um, we end up with very different estimates for what the net concentrations in the atmosphere would be. And so the, um, the mustardy color is that 2002 Kevin Gurney Vulcan estimate, and the blue is this 2010 higher resolution uh, estimate from the city. And again, the black are our observations. So there's a huge difference in what the estimated emissions are, and we're not yet able to predict this very well. So what this suggests to me is that while we're making a lot of goals about uh, reducing CO2 emissions, our current ability to verify some of that attainment, um, and this is some of the best technology that we have to get at that, we're not there yet. So um, it's an exciting research opportunity. So in summary, so I have a couple of minutes for questions. Um, these new observational networks that are emerging, they really represent some fantastically exciting opportunities to take what we've been doing here at the Harvard Forest for a long time, and we're very good at these biophysical, biochemical measurements, and start to be able to apply them in really novel ecosystems. And ULTRA is one example of that, um, and the question that I've shared some of the results from um, today about urban metabolism is one example, but this, uh, there are many other um, questions that can be tackled in this domain. And um, cities, I, I skipped the um, introduction on why urban matters, but I'll, I'll conclude with it, which is cities account for about 70% of our CO2 emissions. And if we are gonna at, at some point regulate CO2, come up with robust policies for CO2, we need to be able to really get that urban signature of it. And we're doing a lot of wide-scale efforts already. Um, the Boston Climate Action Plan, the, um, every city seems to have a plan of reduced by 90% by year such and such. Um, but we don't yet have the tools to be able to verify that they've attained those goals. Um, and some of our urban greening efforts, while the intentions are good, they may not necessarily be having the impact that we think that they're having or be located in the right place. So with that, I'll just acknowledge that there are many people that have been working on this project and I've just shown um, a tidbit of it. And Anne Short will show, will share some of the results on one of the social science projects that we've that's associated with this. 
Our financial support from this has been um, trickling in. Um, so uh, we were initially supported by the National Science Foundation and the Forest Service. We've secured additional funding from uh, Boston University and Harvard, as well as the Conservation Law Foundation, the Environmental Defense Fund. We just won last week, it was announced the IBM Smarter Cities Challenge to work on this urban transportation issue in more detail. And um, these are some of our four partners. So with that, I'll stop. Great, so Lucy's talk is really um, highlighting some of the um, the importance of doing long-term research, but also doing long-term research in urban areas and then find enough spatial scale to begin to capture some of the answers to the as yet unresolved questions about carbon exchange. Um, can we have plenty of time for questions? Adrian, uh-oh. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was wondering, you were saying the, the sources and sinks of CO2 in your uh, graph of time, CO2 concentrations, it wasn't really uh, Models weren't good for data. No. So I was just curious though, it's hard to stare at that graph. I mean, can you close <laughs> a budget to any degree? So I was the error on that? Um, I can't answer any of those questions okay. yet. Um, I literally got these results oh, last the week. Yeah, um, this, <laughs> these results come from um, a senior thesis project as well as one of Steve Wofsky's graduate students mm -hmm. who's been leading this. Um, and the agreement is not there yet. Um, the models do particularly badly at dawn and dusk, which is not at all surprising because that's when you have some of the most biological activity. Um, you have changes in the uh, atmospheric stratification and the boundary layer, and that's when we have some of the highest emissions and changes in emissions having to do with on-road people's heating coming on as they're waking up. So we do very poorly at that transition. At midday, it's not bad. Um, so at midday, the model does agree with observations pretty well. Um, one of the efforts that I've been working very hard to get funded is to try to bring in um, an upward-looking spectrometer to measure total con column concentrations, which is another estimate on this problem. That, and this model also estimates that. It's also what, what OCO is going to be measuring. So um, this is the first results, and they're not that great. The model has worked in other places but it comes down to our phasing. But the phasing is not horrible. I mean, there's yeah. a good amount of phasing. Question? 